It's uh, such an exciting time uh, in science, and moments like these are a powerful reminder that the spirit of the community is alive and well here in Seattle. Now, I think back to 1989. I was just starting a job in San Francisco in television, and I had I, I was out in the hallway outside our offices, and somebody who I didn't know very well, that I, had, I had just been just started, came out into the hallway, and he was obviously devastated and in tears. And I kind of, you know, I, I didn't know how much I wanted to pry, but I just said, is everything okay? Kind of a dumb question to ask somebody who's obviously not okay. And he revealed to me that he had just been diagnosed HIV positive. This is 1989, and at that time, there was nothing that I could say, that anyone could say, to offer hope. But you think about what a long way we have come. And now you think about how bright and how promising the future is. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're here for a conversation about actually curing HIV and AIDS. The numbers that bring us together are grim. More than a million people in the US live with HIV. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Project project that there will be 55,000 new cases of HIV every single year in the US. That's 151 new diagnoses today alone. So this is still happening. And globally, the World Health Organization estimates that about 34 million people currently live with HIV, approximately the amount of people in the greater metropolitan region of Tokyo, which is the world's most populous urban region. And that figure includes 3.4 million children. We've lived for a long and difficult time without hope for a cure for HIV, but all of a sudden, in just the last few short years, all of that has changed. And tonight, all of us together will hear how that hope has been rekindled and how we may not be so far away from something that a few years ago we would have called a miracle. It doesn't mean the answer will be quick or guaranteed or easy, but having lived through the history of this disease, a little hope means a lot, and we can all play a role. We start by gathering here tonight to hear the stories and to take them out and to share them with our friends. We're about to hear from the experts who will tell us how we've come to have this dramatic progress that is being made at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. While it is known as a place for innovation in cancer research, the Hutch is actually also one of the world's top HIV AIDS research institutions, and it's right here in our own backyard. And then we'll hear firsthand the inspiring story of the man who used to be known only as the Berlin patient and who is now known by his name, Timothy Brown. Timothy is a pioneering survivor and in a sense, his astounding journey actually began at the Hutch, when you think about it, which is where his life-saving treatment was developed. But before Timothy takes the podium, we'd like to set the stage with some of the science that's changing the way that we think about and respond to HIV. And so I'll start us off by introducing Dr. Julie McElrath. Dr. McElrath is a senior vice president and director of one of Fred Hutch's five divisions, the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division. In her own right, she's a world-renowned virologist focused on the study of HIV. Uh, Dr. McElrath leads the laboratory program behind the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, the largest clinical trials network for testing potential HIV vaccines headquartered at the Hutch. Dr. McElrath also runs the local HVTN site known as the HVTU. She's also contributed important work on those few people who are long-term non-progressors, a group of HIV-positive individuals whose biology just might hold valuable information to help research progress. So please welcome me now, in, uh, please welcome me, yeah. <laughs> please join me now in welcoming Dr. Julie McElrath. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to see this fantastic turnout that we have tonight. And we're gonna tell you an amazing story, uh, one that I think will thrill you and leave you excited of where we wanna go. Um, but to start this off, I've, asked, I've been asked to give you just a brief uh, overview 
of what we do at uh, Fred Hutch um, and making breakthroughs to fight cancer, um, HIV, and other types of diseases. Now, the head of our Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center is Larry Corey, and Larry Corey is unable to be with us tonight because, in fact, he's in Africa trying to convince all the people we need to convince, particularly regulatory people, that it's time for us to really accelerate HIV vaccine trials in South Africa. So he's doing his part there, and um, I'm gonna do my part here. So I only have a few minutes, and so I'm gonna ask a favor of you. I want you to think with me uh, about a loved one, a family member, or a friend who has suffered from cancer or from HIV or AIDS. And I want you to keep that person in mind uh, or those people or the community of people uh, with these diseases. Um, as we hear speakers tonight, we want to convey to you that it is these thoughts about these people that drive us every day in the work that we do. The researchers and the staff at Fred Hutchinson have a true passion for people with these diseases. We are creative and we're collaborative. We have compassion, we have innovation, we have integrity, and we have a vision. So those are the things that we have and that we really want to put forth toward cancer, and toward HIV and many other diseases that involve human, man, human mankind. So one of the really key areas that kicked this off for Fred Hutchinson uh, was uh, the creativity and passion of E. Donald Thomas, who in the 1970s um, pioneered work in human bone marrow, trans bone marrow transplantation at the Hutchinson. He was a real visionary, and to, make, to cut the story short, his work has now been shown to convert some cancers which were nearly universally fatal um, to basically saving up to 95% of them. Um, this work uh, was so amazing that in 1990, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. This is something we're incredibly proud of. And he and two other scientists have also shared that honor uh, who've been scientists at Fred Hutchinson. So this groundbreaking work um, has now carried on at the Hutchinson. Many uh, physicians and scientists uh, have been trained in this area and the work has advanced. Uh, it's become much more sophisticated and it's really evolved into taking care of many other types of cancers. Um, that we know and are common. Uh, one other thing that has evolved from that has just been the, the very concept of immunotherapy um, dating back from the transplantation. And this is an approach that really takes the, lets the immune system help fight these cancers. Um, and this approach can be beneficial for not only um, the uh, uh, things like cancer, but it's also an approach that we're thinking about also um, for HIV. So there are many stories of innovation at Fred Hutchinson, and we don't have time to go into all of them, but needless to say, they're really in a range of diseases, uh, including things like mus muscular dystrophy and diabetes. But the one that we're here to talk about tonight is HIV and AIDS. So, Many of you probably know that Fred Hutchinson is a, is a leader in this field of HIV, and we have been for many, many years. And so in the people that who have come to Fred Hutchinson, sort of inspired by what has happened in the transplant and cancer field, we felt that we could really do types of work like that could, that could be innovative for HIV. And so thinking back to that person or that community or the people you know who've had HIV, and it's been a very personal thing, I'm sure, for many of you in this room. It certainly has for me. As a physician in the early 80s, as an intern, I saw some of the very first cases. We had no clue what was going on. 
And really what we wanted to do was to m tell this person we had something to make them better, something that could really cure them. So we haven't been able to do that for many years, and so what we've done is we've, we've taken the approach, well, let's try to prevent these infections. And as a result of that, the Hutchinson has become a major headquarters uh, for HIV vaccine work globally. Uh, we work in over 30 countries um, in, to, to fight uh, HIV in a way to try to prevent HIV infection. And so we also have one of those clinics here in Seattle, the Seattle Vaccine Clinic, and, and I'm sure that there may be some of you here who have been volunteers in these studies, and we thank you for doing that. But tonight we're going to talk about something even more groundbreaking, and that is the ability to think about a cure for HIV. This is something that we think can be done. And so what we're here to do tonight is to tell you about how we think we could try to do that at Fred Hutchinson. And we're really going to take it as an example of what uh, we have uh, with Timothy Brown, who has been daring and bold and is here to really talk to us about that has worked for him. So I'd like to, to introduce to you three dedicated scientists who are going to spearhead this. The first of these is Keith Jerome. Keith is a virologist. Uh, he's an associate member in both my division, the Vaccine Infectious Disease Division, and the Clinical Research Division at Fred Hutch. He's a professor and head of the virology division at the University of Washington, where he's also a professor. Uh, Keith is interested in chronic viruses and finding ways for these viruses um, to dodge the immune system, finding ways that the immune system can actually help these viruses as well. Now, the second speaker is Dr. Uh, Hans-Peter Kiem. Uh, Dr. Kiem is an oncologist, and he is a key part of the internationally recognized Fred Hutchinson stem cell transplant team. He's a member also of the Clinical Research Division at Fred Hutch, and he holds the Jose Carreras E. Donald Thomas Endowed Chair for Cancer Research. Uh, he's also a professor at the University of Washington. He works on the intersection of stem cell research and gene therapy advances. And this intersection will play a critical role as we think about trying to use stem cell therapies in genetic editing for a range of challenging diseases, including HIV and AIDS. And then finally, we're privileged um, to have Dr. Michelle Andresik here today. Michelle is a social scientist who works closely with our HIV community. M many of you probably know her. Her mission is to increase the availability of HIV educational resources to marginalized uh, communities. Since she's joined the Hutch, uh, she's focused on innovative methods to involve communities into clinical research and to get them in at the very earliest stages. Um, her work um, is a long-standing priority uh, for HIV research at the Hutch, and we're really privileged to have her here. So each of these researchers will now come up and share exactly what they're doing to contribute to the fight for the cure. And we'll first start with Keith Jerome. Well, I have to start off by just uh, telling you I am absolutely thrilled to see this room full of excited people about HIV cure research. So thank you all for being here. I was asked to explain a little bit about what we do in the laboratory, and I thought that rather than try to give you a seminar, <laughs> I'll spare you that, um, that I would tell you, give you a little bit of an insight into how the mind of a scientist works, what makes us come back and do this job that sometimes is difficult and sometimes goes slowly and has a lot of frustrations. And it's those rare aha moments of just joy when things move forward. So I'm going to tell you about three of those that keep me coming back to do more. Um, as background, I'm a virologist, as Julie said, and I work on a lot of different viruses. And over the years, quite honestly, HIV was not necessarily the main focus of my work. Um, I followed HIV and Julie's work and certainly did some, but 
I always looked at it and said, this is such a hard virus because, you know, this virus, it, it, it gets into these cells of the immune system and then it, it actually integrates into the DNA of those cells, it becomes part of the, of the actual stuff of life. And I always thought, wow, you know what we really need, you know, what we need is some sort of like little scissors, like molecular scissors we could go in and actually like cut that thing out and throw it away and get rid of it, you know. And I thought, when that thing comes, that's when it would be fun to be, be in HIV research. So at the Fred Hutch, they have this little newsletter that goes around so we can kind of keep track of what everybody's doing. And the first aha moment came when I was reading about work from my colleague, uh, Dr. Barry Stoddard at the Fred Hutch. And Barry described his work in this article and it said, well, we're working on these um, inherited diseases that children have and we'd like to fix these genes that they have problems in. So we've, we've developed these proteins that can go in and make a little cut right there. Oh, that's interesting. And he said, yeah, these are really great, so we want to make this little cut, and we're going to put the proper copy of the gene in there and fix everything. So we're really excited. This is all really great. He said, you know, we're not there yet. The, the, the major problem is when we try to put these things in, it, we're having a hard time getting the thing in. Usually what we get is this just kind of a chunk kind of gets cut out right around where we made that snip. And I looked at that and went, oh, my God, that is what we need for this virus. Because if we make that cut in HIV and pull a bunch of it out, we just made that dream come real, right? So I, tr I, I literally remember as close to running down the hall as you can do at the Fred Hutch, <laughs> uh, zipping down to Barry's life and said, Barry, we got to do this. And, 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 you know, for a scientist, that is the moment you live for when there's an idea and you realize you might have a tool to do something you've dreamed about for years. Um, so then you've got to make this thing into a reality, right? What do, what do you do? And, you know, you might say, well, go talk to the National Institutes of Health and they'll give you, you know, some money to do this research because it, it costs, right? You've got to buy chemicals and you've got to pay smart people to help you. Um, and <laughs> well, you know, NIH will be very happy to give you money for it after you've proven that it can work. <laughs> um, I'm exaggerating and I'll never get another grant. Uh, <laughs> um, but really, it's difficult. So. One wonderful thing that happened at Fred Hutch that under Julie's leadership, actually, our division, the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division, um, put up a, a small grant proposal just for the people at the Hutch that said, if you've got some idea that you think might be promising, but you haven't, got, you know, you haven't done anything on it, it's nothing more than an idea, we have a little bit of money that we've gotten from donors and things, uh, people who've supported the Hutch and our research, we'll give you a little bit of that. So, that, so they gave us $75,000 to do this. And about the same time, the Gates Foundation had heard, and they gave us 100000 So we took this little tiny bit. I'm sorry. It's a, it's, you know, it's a lot of money in life, but, you know, science is expensive. So it, it doesn't go very far. But we did, we did a couple of experiments, and, and we got to aha moment number two because a, a, a woman who's worked in my lab for 10 years, Martino Bear, did an experiment in which she basically – Made, made an HIV, put it into cells right in, in the laboratory and took one of these scissors. And, and we said, okay, let's give this thing a try. What do the scissors really do? And usually in science, you try something and you have this great idea and, and you think, oh, maybe something kind of happened and you try to fix it over months and it's very slow. But this was a different experiment because this worked beyond my wildest dreams the first time we did it. I mean, we looked and the virus was cut and pieces had come out and it was everything we had dreamed for. And I said, you know, I think we might really be onto something. So, you know, the Gates Foundation, again, was generous with us. Um, they gave us a million dollars to move this forward. Um, and, and, the, and the work continued to progress. And the final moment that, that was just really wonderful was kind of what has led to tonight, um, is that a couple years later, the National Institutes of Health came around and they said, you know, there might be something to this cure thing. It wasn't necessarily about our work, but science as a whole, people were starting to make some inroads. Maybe there was some hope. And they said, we're going to put some serious money into this. They said, we're going to put $50 million into this, um, into cure. So, you know, that's a lot of money for research, for the government, you know. But um, they said, we'll put $50 million into it. And here are the things. You've got to have groups of scientists to work together and collaborate because this is going to take a team because it's really hard. Um, so, you know, put in your application with your team and, and we'll see how you do. Now, honestly, they, I think they kind of had their groups picked out because they knew these are the people working on HIV in San Francisco and these are the people in North Carolina. Um, and then they had uh, a couple of other people because when we heard about this, I ran down the hall to somebody you're just about to talk to. I said, who's the smartest person I can talk to here at the Hutch? I said, I got to go talk to Hans-Peter Kiem. 
So I ran down there, and we put something together. Now, Hans Peter is also a scientist with a lot of different interests, not all are HIV. So we were kind of the dark horse in this. So I'll just tell you to cut to the chase. We put together something as the absolute outsiders in this. Who are these people from Seattle? And we actually won that competition. And NIH decided that they were going to give three. And they threw in another $20 million that's right here in Seattle today working toward a cure for HIV at the Fred Hutch. An incredibly exciting moment. Those are the things we live for. They're also scary moments when you think that, you know, the hopes of the nation and, and the world are on our shoulders. So we're here to, you know, get everybody excited, um, let you feel a bit of our excitement, and then let you touch the reality of what a cure really looks like. So at this point, you know, we heard about what transplantation, how important this is to what we're doing. We heard Don Thomas won the Nobel Prize. His torch is being carried forward by brilliant scientists at the Hutch, including the next speaker, uh, Dr. Hans-Peter Kiem. Well, thank you very much, uh, Keith, and uh, it's wonderful to see uh, um, all you people here, and it's, it's, it's really a great pleasure to uh, speak here and, and introduce uh, our progress here in our grant. So I'd like to start out also with a personal story. Um, I still remember when I was a medical student, um, this was in the mid, mid 80s, late 80s. Um, I was a medical student back in Germany. Uh, I'm from Germany, from Ulm in Germany. And so when I was rotating back then on a bone marrow transplant unit, on a bone marrow transplant floor, um, they had just started bone marrow transplantations uh, back then. This was again the mid 80s, late 80s. And I, I just remember everyone was talking about Seattle, Fred Hutch, about Don Thomas. You know, all the different protocols that were used there came from the Fred Hutch. Do you have a question? Well, we gotta talk to the Fred Hutch folks. Well, is there anything we can do here? Well, we gotta call Fred Hutch. So it was really exciting, I have to say, to be there back then to see that, wow, this is really an important field. And, and I have to be honest, that was exactly when I, when I, I simply got fascinated with bone marrow transplantation and, and really the science behind bone marrow transplantation in, in, in bone marrow cells. I mean, just imagine, you take a few cells, right, from a patient, and then, you know, these cells, you give them back to another patient or to, to a, a, a recipient of, of a, for a transplant, and then these cells, they can, in fact, they can engraft, they can get into the, the, the patient, and they can make all these other blood cells. I figured that, that's simply fascinating. A few cells make all these other blood cells, right? And so I, that really captured me, uh, I have to say, and I, I, since that time, I have to say, I've, I've been interested in bone marrow transplantation, these bone marrow cells, um, yeah. So the next step for me was, um, obviously, what, what do I do now? So I was trying to come to the Fred Hutch, an obvious thing to do, right, if you're interested in bone marrow and bone marrow transplantation. So I was fortunate about five years later then um, that I was able to join the Fred Hutch. Uh, I was able to join Reiner Storb's lab and the bone marrow transplant team and was able to contribute to the really enormous progress we've now made over the past 20 years, I have to say. Uh, this has really been an incredible experience that we are now able to cure patients you know, for certain diseases you know, in the 90% range. So it's truly been an exciting, exciting uh, e experience for me. And, and I should also say there's now more than 65,000 transplants being done worldwide, and more than a million have been done since the development by Don Thomas. So that is really an a very exciting uh, uh, field here. And, when I talk with Timothy, I also uh, keep saying, well, it, it's probably, probably one of your physicians was here at the Fred Hutch at some point and trained here because we've trained so many people. So for me as a bone marrow transplant phys physician and somebody who's really interested in bone marrow stem cells and bone marrow cells, it was really exciting for me to see, to hear about Timothy, Timothy Brown and that we can now use bone marrow transplantation to cure, to cure HIV that was really way out there. And so just to give you a little bit of a background with Timothy, I mean, he was, he was unfortunate because he had HIV and then developed leukemia. He got chemotherapy, the typical treatment for leukemia. He then, unfortunately, his disease came back after the chemotherapy, so that was clear then he needed a bone marrow transplant. Now, he was actually quite lucky because his physicians, they were looking for a very special donor, a donor 
a transplant donor that was not only matched to Timothy, to Timothy's blood and immune system, but was also HIV resistant. I mean, that was very unique back then. I mean, that was extremely, you know, uh, I think he was extremely lucky to be in that situation at that time. So just to put this in perspective, there's only about 1% of people who are, who are HIV resistant, so that they have such cells that are HIV resistant. And these cells are, they have a particular gene, CCR5 gene, that is, that is uh, the CCR5 gene is sort of the doorway for HIV. And in these, in these people, normal people, this doorway is disabled, so they cannot get infected. So he received a transplant from such a donor who is resistant to HIV. And that was, I mean, again, the first, and that was just fascinating uh, to see that. And so how we were thinking about is how can we now turn this around? I mean, how, how could this be applied to more patients? Since obviously this is still, Timothy is still the only patient treated with such a transplant from an adult donor. I mean, after all these years, and it's been now six or seven years, as he will tell you. So that's exactly where my laboratory comes in. My laboratory has been interested in, in bone marrow cells, bone marrow stem cells for the last 20 years. And we've been interested in, in developing gene therapy approaches to target bone marrow cells. So now what we can do is we can, we can use all these tools we've developed over the past 20 years. We can take the patient's own marrow cells, bring them back to the laboratory, and make them HIV resistant right there, just like the, the natural HIV resistant donor. So we can make these cells now resistant and then return those cells to the patient. Wonderful, obviously, because now this procedure can be done for a lot more patients because we can simply take the patient's own marrow cells and it's also better tolerated uh, than using a donor, for an unrelated donor, right, or even a family donor. So that was really exciting for us. And in fact, we are gonna start clinical trials and studies later this year using a very similar approach, first in patients with uh, AIDS lymphoma, so that in patients who have uh, a, a blood uh, disease. So this is really fascinating, and, and for, again, for a transplant like myself to see that bone marrow transplantation, the story, Timothy's story, has now really shifted the direction of HIV research. I mean, this, this is just mind-boggling. I mean, you have to realize, for the past probably, I mean, many years, the cure, I mean, has really been on the back burner. That has not really, people have not talked about cure. And now to change that direction, just you now due to Timothy, now the direction to pursue a cure and eradication of, of HIV, that is, that is truly fascinating. And I have to say, uh, uh, inspiring for somebody who is obviously, you know, who has been interested in bone marrow transplantation for the better part of my life. And I think with, with that, I'll, I'll move into the uh, next speaker here. Uh, Dr. Andrasek, and uh, why don't you come up? Thank you. Good evening. It's so good to see so many community people and so many researchers and a fan base, apparently, <laughs> that I have. Thank you. <laughs> so. So I, you know, I've been um, doing HIV work since 1993. I've had um, family members, friends, loved ones who have died of HIV and many who are living with HIV um, now. And in 1993, I remember I was graduating from college and my mom was like, you made it, finally. You know, that means you can get out of the hood, you can move on. And I'm like, well, I got a job. I'm working at the Methadone Maintenance Clinic on 135th and Lenox. <laughs> uh, for not as much money as all the people who I graduated from college were making. But one of the things, you know, I had known at that time that HIV was a real issue in my community. And in the two years that I worked in the, in the clinic and then working in the community in not-for-profit after that, really got to see firsthand how um, HIV was impacting the community and became very, very interested in some of the social and structural determinants that um, really fuel HIV in um, marginalized communities, poverty, homophobia, racism, discrimination, um, and really felt like I needed to do something about that. 
So I went back to school. And long story, I ended up here in Seattle. And three years ago, I met with Jim Kublin, who was, who's the executive director of the HVTN, and Steve Wakefield, who I think a lot of you know, about the work that was going on at the HVTN. And as I sat there and I listened to some of the challenges that they were having in vaccine trials, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exciting. This is the kind of work that I do. And I think that this would be a great fit for me. And three years later, it has been an amazing, amazing marriage, if it were. And we've worked on many things. Currently, we're working on trying to figure out the best possible way to um, present the informed consent. We have a very, very long, very involved informed consent. Any of you who've been in our studies know it is a little novella. And so we're really working on different ways that we can ensure that participants understand what they're signing up for. And not only that they understand, but that they can communicate with their family, their friends, the community, to really um, be another conduit where we can get the research out into the community. As all of you know, I've worked very, very um, tirelessly to bridge community and um, research, and uh, we're still uh, making very good progress uh, with the community advisory board and other venues to really uh, connect community with researchers and to foster really collaborative work and to maintain those relationships um, for, you know, the research that's going on now and research down the road. We've also done quite a bit of work to look at what are some of the barriers and facilitators for people to be involved in research? And what can we do to make our research a more welcoming and friendly environment for people who participate in the studies? And how can we educate the larger community um, about research? And how can not only educate them about what's going on, like these two um, brilliant scientists have been doing, but how do we get the community to really get involved in the research process and to realize that research works for the community and is for the community good? So being involved and having a voice from the very beginning and through all stages of research is critical for community members, and how can we as researchers make research more access or more accessible to the community? So those are really all of the things that we're doing um, at the VTN. And it's been a pleasure for me actually to be part of the Hutch and to be part of the UW uh, Fred Hutch CIFAR, um, which I think uh, both organizations are doing wonderful work. And I, you know, would like to say to all of you, you know, that, you know, research, we really all are owners in the research enterprise. And if you can do nothing more, you know, there are a few things that you can do to get involved in research. But the one thing we can all do is go get an HIV test. You know, anytime I'm up on the stage, I have to say, test, go get tested. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So getting tested, also, you know, getting involved in research. There are many ways that uh, we can be involved as community members. There are community action boards, community advisory boards. Uh, you know, I would love to see any of you at the community action board. Uh, we welcome any community members. Also, you know, one of the things that we work with day in and day out is stigma. There's still a lot of stigma around HIV. I remember when I was little, you know, my aunt had the C word, and we didn't talk about what that was. Um, and now, you know, look at where we've come. You know, 40 years later, um, cancer is uh, not as stigmatized as it was 40 years ago. And what I would like to see in the next 10 years is that <laughs> HIV reaches that same level and where participants 
who I've seen in our research who are the most altruistic, selfless individuals who've given years, months of their life to be a part of our study can't disclose that they've been in this wonderful thing that they've given of themselves because they're afraid of how the community might see them. They're afraid that they'll be seen as high risk and all of the dirty laundry that comes with the high risk um, label that we give to people. So, you know, go talk to the community about the wonderful research that's been um, that's being done uh, at the Hutch, and you know, try whatever you can do to reduce the stigma around HIV because it's still alive and well, and there are many wonderful people who um, aren't able to disclose all of themselves because of that. Well, Michelle and Hans-Peter and I are all smart enough to know that you didn't really come here to hear a bunch of scientists. <laughs> Although, Michelle, you actually have a pretty good uh, fan club out here. Uh, but tonight is, not about, uh, tonight is not about us. Tonight is really a celebration of hope. Hope for a cure for HIV. Um, and hope tonight is really embodied in a person, uh, a person who's been cured of HIV. Uh, yeah. Um, in my opinion, the first person to be cured of HIV is a hero. Uh, this person could have been cured of HIV, uh, gone back to private life, and never thought about the virus again. But instead, he really made a choice. He made a choice to become the face of hope for a cure. Um, he has worked tirelessly, tireless, tirelessly toward a, a cure and really um, given of himself, metaphorically and also literally, in terms of blood and, and tissue that scientists around the world can study. Um, really, no one has done more to further this cause that we're all here for uh, in the world that I know of than our next guest. So, so it's truly a great pleasure and an honor to introduce to you the first person to be cured of HIV, Timothy Ray Brown. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I, I usually give my speeches reading, um, but I bear with me, I'm not gonna read. I'm going to speak from my heart. And uh, I hope that you'll listen to me. Um, <laughs> I, I moved to Europe uh, in 1991 with a friend of mine who's here, Tony. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I didn't know he was coming. He heard about this from uh, the Seattle Times article that came out about, about me yesterday. And, and he brought his wife, Deirdre, and uh, um, also uh, a very wonderful person, Tim Hopkin, um, is here. He showed up. He called me last night and said he was coming um, from, from Vegas. And, um, which is the last place I live. And uh, I have moved to Seattle probably for the summer um, to uh, work with Fred Hutch and whomever else wants to, um, to deal with me. <laughs> uh, and I'm planning on moving to Palm Springs. I had originally planned to move to Washington DC so I could be close to, uh, to politics but after watching House of Cards, I kind of got scared. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so I've decided to move to Palm Springs to a, a nicer, <laughs> a nicer coast. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, Dave <laughs> and Chad and and Tony. Uh, um, yeah, uh, they're from the East Coast. Um, Florida and Washington, D.C. Um, Dave um, uh, has just
decided to stay in Vegas um, because he met somebody there and um, he's very happy there. And that's why he's decided to live there. So anyway, uh, back to my story. Uh, I, I had actually, um, in Seattle, I had um, participated in, um, uh, with ACT UP Seattle. Um, we uh, went to the mayor's office and um, I was told not to say anything, but uh, um, I, some, some aide asked me, um, asked me a question or asked us a question and I blurted out an answer and I was told, shh, shut up. <laughs> And uh, um, I did that with Andy, who's over here. And uh, um, we also did a protest of Nordstrom because they had fired somebody because of because the the guy had been um, diagnosed with HIV. And uh, we passed out flyers and interrupted the uh, the fashion show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, oh, and the, uh, the woman who worked at the um, Chanel um, part of the store came up and said, I'm so happy that you did that. that it was very mean of Nordstrom to fire him. And um, so we got support from somebody in the store. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I moved to Europe in 1991 after taking a trip with um, three, two friends of mine. Um, for three months, and uh, and uh, I moved there with Tony, and uh, we moved to Barcelona, and then I ended up in Berlin um, for various reasons. I um, I would ha I'd actually planned to um, go and meet Tony and a couple other friends there, um, and this is a back in the day without cell phones, and so we never got. A, in touch with us for a whole, uh, with each other for a whole month. <laughs> and uh, so I, I spent a, um, a month in Berlin and um, met somebody there and asked the guy to, uh, if he wanted to come visit me in Barcelona. And he said yes. Um, so he came, went down to Barcelona with me and um, we, I got kicked out of my apartment by one of my um, roommates um, for various reasons, uh, and uh, um, which I won't go into. Uh, um, anyway, um, I ended up um, moving to Berlin um, to live with uh, this friend of mine. And uh, we moved there, and um, things didn't really work out. And uh, so um, we weren't together anymore after, after a while. Um, and then I, I ended up moving back to Berlin, or no, back to Barcelona um, with a friend of mine. Um, he wanted to move to a different large city in Europe. And uh, um, we chose Madrid. And then I went down to Barcelona um, prior to him coming. And uh, I <coughs> uh, met up with friends of mine and ended up getting a, an apartment for both of us, um, separate par apartments. And so he moved down um, there to be with, I called him up and said, um, I kind of stuck here in Barcelona and I, I really uh, want to live here. So um, why don't we move here? And he said, okay. Uh, so anyway, I ended up, uh, um, living down there for a little while and things didn't work out, so I moved back to Berlin to study because I didn't want to learn Catalan. <laughs> I had already learned Spanish and that was enough. And um, I had started to learn German and um, so I decided to move back to Berlin. And I moved back there and started studying. And um, I, w I was taking a, uh, a course for, um, for people that want foreigners that wanted to study. And uh, I was about finished with that. And then a friend of mine with whom I'd had a relationship said, I've tested positive for HIV. I think you should get tested as well. 
And so um, this was in 1995. And uh, so I went to the, a place called the Tolpen Institute and uh, I got tested and sure enough, I, it came back positive. <laughs> and that was devastating. Um, uh, it didn't help that that friend of mine told me that we only had about two years to live. And uh, I was scared to death. And uh, then I, oh, I talked with the doctor um, who told me about my test result. And she said, we've also tested your um, CD4 level, T cell level, and it's quite low. And uh, I think you need to start treatment right away. And I, I um, there was only ACT at the time, and uh, I didn't want to take ACT because I'd heard that um, it, it actually killed people, the drug um, that was supposed to cure, or not cure people, but um, treat people and make their life better. And uh, anyway, I didn't tell my mother for a long time. I told um, people that I worked with, um, my bosses at work. I worked in a cafe, um, if anybody knows Berlin, on Checkpoint Charlie. Um, it's called Cafe Adler. I worked, actually ended up working there for 10 years because um, I, eventually started translating from, w once I learned German, I translated from German to English. And I still stayed at the cafe, I couldn't, I couldn't leave. Uh, uh, and I had very good friends there. Uh, they were people that I had told that, were some of the people that I had first told that I was HIV positive, and they were very important to me. Um, so anyway, I, so I, started taking AZT and took that as a monotherapy for about a year until 1996 when uh, new medication started coming out. And so I started taking um, new medication. I can't remember exactly what I took. But anyway, um, uh, I, was, I did very well and um, had very few side effects. And I um, thought I could live for a long time. I thought I might have a normal life. So I decided to continue studying. I studied at a university in Berlin, a, um, a public university. And uh, I, one reason why I wanted to study in Berlin is because, or in Germany, um, is because uh, it was free. Um, <laughs> I didn't have to pay anything. Well, um, a slight, it was like 100 marks, which was like $50. Per, per semester. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's another thing about Germany is that um, they have a national healthcare system and uh, I, I had to pay for medical insurance, but everyone had medical insurance and uh, um, it was very low cost. Um, it kind of depended on your income. And uh, I, I was very pleased to uh, get that. I actually, um, while I had HIV, I got um, what's called the wasting syndrome. I, I was very gaunt, and my cheeks were um, were very hollow. And uh, I met with a um, with a plastic surgeon who wanted to inject fat cells from my belly into my cheeks, and uh, he he did that, and um, the the medical system paid for it. <coughs> so yeah, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, they paid for er all my um, HIV care. Um, I never had to pay anything for medical care there. Even when I ended up, when I found out I had acute myeloid leukemia. Um, they paid for my hospital stay. They wanted to keep me in there much more than I wanted to be there. <laughs> um, it was very difficult to, I kept saying, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. And they wouldn't let me go home. Um, and uh, I, I finally did talk them into letting me go home. And as it turned out, um, they, um, the doctors put me on, um, 
uh, on, um, I'm drawing a blank, um, a very intense um, pain treatment. Um, basically, they, oh, they wanted to give me so much of it that it would have put me to sleep and I wouldn't have woken up ever again. And uh, so I, Anyway, in 2006, I found out uh, I had um, severe fatigue, and um, I it took me longer longer to get to work than usual, and I got um, bitched at by my boss, <laughs> who um, said, "You're late," and I said, "Well, um, I have no energy. I, I I think I have a problem," and then during lunch, I rode my bike to a restaurant, and on the way there, I had to stop halfway and get off my bike and uh, walk, and I called my partner who said, um, I, and told him what was wrong, and he said, I'll make sure you get a doctor's appointment tomorrow. And so I went in and found out that I, um, I had um, severe anemia. My red blood cell count was way down, and so they wanted to to replace it with a, an infusion, a red blood cell infusion. And uh, so I got, I got treatment, or I got the, the several bags of blood, and uh, um, uh, after, after about a week of doing the same thing, um, they realized that the, the values would go up and then fall down rapidly. And so it wasn't doing any good. So he decided to send me to an oncologist. I went to the oncologist who said his gut feeling told him that I didn't have anything severe. Um, but he, 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 did, he did a, um, a bone marrow biopsy. And uh, the bone, bone marrow, marrow biopsy was done, done on a Friday. And I was supposed to come back on Monday. So I went back on Monday and um, my partner was waiting out in the waiting, waiting out in the car, and um, and while I was in there, um, the doctor said I was wrong about my diagnosis. Um, you actually do have acute myeloid leukemia, <coughs> and that was a big shock to me. Um, and I said, "Well, what do I need to do?" And he said, "I'm going to." I said, I don't really want to be in a hospital where they're going to judge me because I have HIV, because there was still stigma in Germany. Um, people, uh, for example, my partner had been in um, a small city called Halle, and uh, they had found out that he was HIV positive, and um, he heard, overheard the nurses saying, be careful, he's got AIDS. And uh, uh, yeah, I was kind of afraid that that would happen. And uh, so he said, I'm gonna send you, I'm gonna try to get you um, into uh, um, this, uh, this um, part of the Berlin, um, Berlin public hospital system. And uh, I, I used to work here, so I think you should go here. And so he called up and said, Hi, I'm um, Andreas Kirsch, and uh, I've got a patient here who has HIV, and but he's also got acute myeloid leukemia, and he needs to be treated. And he happened to get Dr. Gary Hooter on the phone, um, who turned out to be my savior. Um, uh, so he, um, Dr. Hooter said, send him in. And um, so I found out one day that I had the leukemia and the next day I was in the hospital um, receiving chemo treatment. Um, in order to do the chemo treatment, they had to um, take about four tubes and put them into my heart. And I had um, tubes coming out of my, out of my neck. Um, yeah, it was kind of a strange feeling. Um, and, and I had to um, wear that for um, like several weeks um, for treatment. In fact, I ended up celebrating my birthday with those tubes coming out of my neck. 
Uh, so anyway, um, I was supposed to receive four rounds of treatment, each one being about a week long, and um, then rest in between. And uh, during the second, second round of treatment, I got a, um, a fungal pneumonia. Yeah, and uh, um, during the third round of treatment, um, I um, had really high fever and my blood pressure was down to practically nothing. And uh, so they put me into an induced coma. Um, my partner and his daughter came in to see me um, and uh, they didn't think I, uh, or they didn't know if I'd live. Um, they, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I did wake up, thank God. Uh, <laughs> they finally took me out of the coma after, um, after about a day. And, uh, um, oh, after, um, during the second round of treatment, um, Dr. Hutcher came to me and said, I'd like to test your blood and send, um, send it to uh, the German um, donor bank a stem cell donor bank, and I didn't understand because I thought, I thought the chemo would be the end of it and I didn't have to um, go through anything else. So I, I said okay, and he sent it in and uh, it came back that I had um, 261 possible donors. Uh, I'll tell you, a lot of people don't even have any donors. I had a, um, I, I knew a guy from Romania um, who was in the hospital at the same time. And uh, he, because he was from Romania, he didn't have any donors. Um, his mother had to donate, which meant that he had half of the, um, the uh, tissue that he actually needed for a, um, a stem cell donation. Um, so I was very lucky. And that gave, um, that gave Dr. Hutter the idea of looking for a donor who was immune to HIV. He had heard about, he, he had heard that there's something called a CCR5 mutation. Um, I realized that um, you said mutation's not really the right, right word because it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and uh, he, uh, um, I was told that it might cost up to a million euros which at that time was about $1.6 million. And um, so it was very expensive. Um, and uh, uh, it came back, well, they kept testing and testing and testing. And on the 61st try, they found a donor who, was, um, who had that mutation. And um, uh, I, uh, after after being um, in that coma, um, Dr. Uter said, I think you need to do something nice, and so why don't you go on vacation? So I went to Italy um, and hung out in Italy for um, about three weeks. And uh, then I went back to work, and uh, uh, I was doing really well, and I didn't think I'd have to get the tr transplant. Um, I, I figured um, it's over with and I, my leukemia was in remission. I talked to family and friends and also a specialist in Dresden about this and um, the specialist agreed with me that I didn't have to risk my life because um, I knew that a stem cell treatment was very risky. Um, it, uh, it had a out, I was told that it, I, I looked up, I looked everything up on the internet. Um, <laughs> I found out that it was like a 50% chance of survival um, through that. I don't know if that's right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't figure I had to risk that. And I, I was happy taking my HIV medication. I didn't think I needed, um, I figured I could live a normal life and live um, an almost normal li life expectancy, and I didn't have to do that. So, um, but then the at the end of the year, 
the, at the end of 2006, the leukemia came back. And um, so it became clear that I had to get the transplant. So I got the transplant in February of 2007. Um, the preparation for that was more chemo and uh, full body irradiation. Um, uh, which killed off my own immune system completely. And there w then, there w of course, there was the risk of what happens if you don't have an immune system. You're very at risk for getting infection. Um, so they kept me in a, um, a room, which was on a ward, which is actually named after a former Fred Hutch patient. I can't remember what the name was. Do you remember, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> Stephen something or other. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so I was stuck, stuck in this room. I could have very few visitors. I think my mother came to visit me then. Um, so um, my mother came and also my, um, my partner, uh, Michelle. And uh, those were like the only people that I was allowed to see besides nurses and doctors. Um, so it was pretty lonely. Anyway, I, I, I got the stem cells. They, um, they were provided by, um, the donor was a, a German man who was living in New York City. So it was kind of a, a, a <laughs> switch. I was the American to be named, later named the Berlin patient. <laughs> and uh, the donor was a German man from, that was living in the United States. <laughs> So anyway, I, I, I got the stem cells, and uh, it's actually very easy for the patient and actually for the donor as well. Um, so if, you, if you're considering donating stem cells, um, it's very easy. They, they give you a medication, and it forces, uh, it forces stem cells out into the blood, and it's um, soldiered into a, into a little bag that um, is like a bag that's for, um, for uh, transfusion. Um, and uh, I got the stem cells. I was very afraid that they wouldn't show up because um, I'd, then I'd be stuck without any immune system. Um, luckily, they did show up. <laughs> I was looking out the window like, are they coming? Are they coming? <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> they did show up, and I was very happy about that. <laughs> um, it happened both times, because I ended up having to get a second um, stem cell transplant from the same donor, and I was afraid, what if the plane crashes? <laughs> um, then I'll, I'll be dead. I'll be here uh, without any immune system. That's not good. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I got the... I got the cells, and uh, the first time, after the first transplant, I um, was able to go back home after the 13th day. And uh, because I didn't have HEV anymore, I, um, I didn't have the wasting syndrome anymore, so I was able to gain muscle weight, and I worked out, and uh, my body was in good shape. I, I, I thought, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I went back to work, and uh, everything was great until, uh, oh, and I found out later that after the third month, uh, I had um, my, I didn't have HEV anymore in my blood, and um, that, I was very happy about that. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you. Um, however, at the end of the year, the leukemia came back, which was very, um, very sad. Um, I had taken a trip to the United States um, with, uh, with my partner's niece and visited my mother. And, uh, and uh, then I, well, beforehand, I had gotten, ended up getting um, what was called the norovirus. Um, and also a, also a um, single cell anemia called Shing uh, Shigella. 
and uh, um, and then um, while I, I visited my grandmother and uh, and the rest of my mother's family in Idaho, and I started feeling like I had um, pneumonia. And so I got my mother to take me to um, a doctor's office in Nampa, Idaho. And uh, um, it turned out that I did have pneumonia. But he also said, um, we noticed that you have very low blood platelets. Um, and I thought, oh, crap, it's come back. Uh, yeah, so I kind of knew that the um, leukemia was back. Uh, which meant another stem cell transplant, um, if if the donor said yes, and if they allowed it. <laughs> um, uh, side note is that they almost didn't allow it because um, I guess I was told later that they gave me a five percent chance of survival. Um, I didn't know that, luckily, because I don't think I would have <laughs> would have made it. Um, but I did make it, and I'm here and. I, I want to thank everyone um, for coming and listening to me. I <laughs> oh. So during the International AIDS Conference in Washington, D.C. in July of 2012, um, I started along with the World AIDS Institute um, a thing called the Timothy Wright Raybon Foundation. And uh, um, its purpose is to help um, institutes like Fred Touch and others to find a cure for HIV and support funding. Um, and we're, we're um, trying to get funding from the government, more funding, um, because the amount of money it's Okay, they're, they're talking millions of dollars, but um, it's not enough. Um, and uh, it's very important to us that, um, that a cure is found for everyone who has HIV. Um, we, uh, the, the, uh, you can't really see it, um, <laughs> but uh, um, it's a blue rose. The blue rose is, uh, it doesn't occur in nature, but in alchemy it means the impossible made possible. And that's the, the um, our slogan is the impossible made po possible. Um, because I am the impossible made possible. <laughs> and I <w> <laughs> And I want everyone else who is HIV infected to also um, be a part of this dream of mine. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Timothy. We want to make sure we get to all the questions uh, from the audience. Um, tonight, but first I just had a couple of questions I wanted to ask those of you on the panel. First of all, Dr. Jerome, based on what you know today, what is the likely cure for HIV AIDS? <laughs> it's a big question, That's isn't it? A, sure, that and is And I'll give you 10 seconds to answer it. Okay, great. <laughs> well, you, there are three groups working on this cure. A and you know, here in Seattle, we're doing some of these genetic therapies and the transplants and the scissors that we talked about. Um, but there are other approaches as well being taken in other parts of the country. So there are approaches that try to kind of harness the power of the immune system to, to fight HIV off better. Um, the group in North Carolina is working a lot on small molecules to try to wake the virus up from its hiding places and get it out where it can be attacked. Um, 
you know, and we're all kind of in a good-natured race to, to see, and we kind of hope that we all get there really quick in a, in a three-way tie soon. Um, but, you know, but, but, but seriously, I think what's likely to happen is a combination of all these things. If we look at how people are being treated now, it's with the combination therapy, Timothy, and, you know, it's the same way with cancer treatments like Julie was talking about. So I suspect these groups are going to work. And, you know, we, we talk all the time on the phone. We have meetings. You know, we really, all these groups work together because we're all really trying to pull in the same direction to bring this to reality. So the answer won't probably come from just one place, but it'll, it'll be a collaborative effort from these so-called collaboratives, these groups that, that are working on various Exactly, you, and it. the collaboratives are all named after Martin Delaney, who many of you will know is a very prominent activist in the community. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and Martin Delaney spoke about cure before anyone else had the courage really to do so. And mm -hmm. so these collaboratories are named in his honor, and I think it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing that, that, that they have come about. Of course, when this all started, people talked about a cure, finding a cure. Then there were, there were other ways to basically control or prevent. And the cure became sort of a C word, the C word, that, that wouldn't, people wouldn't discuss it anymore. That hope is now back, isn't it, in full force because of cases. Well, this case, I was going to say cases like this. There are no other cases like this, though. So congratulations on that. Um, when when uh, Dr. Keem... How soon will people be able to sign up for, for human trials? Very soon, um, actually. Some of these um, mechanisms or tools that we've developed in the laboratory over the past really 10 years are actually ready now that we can really take the software we now form, for example, from the fetal or from stem tissue or HIV. And as I mentioned earlier, with lymphoma or leukemia, and then really make ourselves um, also resistant uh, to HIV. So those tools and techniques are actually already available. and. And we have such a trial coming up, and that will start later this year or early next year, where we can take in a patient's uh, patient cells, marrow cells, and, and indeed make them HIV resistant. And uh, the tools and techniques that we are using to do that, they keep developing and keep getting better. So I do think we'll become uh, more and more efficient as we also learn more about uh, these techniques. Okay. Dr. Andrasik, how do you keep people talking about this issue when... A lot of people just are happy to put it in the background. Is that on? One of the things that we're working on is really um, going out into communities. We have um, an amazing um, uh, program called the Legacy Project, which actually goes into communities and um, gets the word out about research and about HIV. Um, and the Legacy Project works with communities of color. We work with faith-based faith institutions, transgender communities, um, gay, bisexual, and other MSM communities, and really working to get communities talking about um, HIV. And I think more importantly, getting communities to have a voice in the research project uh, process and trying to get them more involved in research and um, trying to show how research can work for the larger community and uh, individuals within that community. Okay, we're gonna get the uh, audience questions here and, and while we're working on that, uh, Timothy, could you tell us a little bit more about your collaboration uh, with the Hutch and, and how it impacts the goals of your own foundation? Or am I on? Yeah. Um, yeah, as was mentioned, there are three collaboratories in the United States. Um, uh, basically, they're all funded by the National Institutes of Health. And uh, Protech is um, one of them, um, yeah, along with other people that work, um, institutes that work with Protech. And uh, um, they're one of their, the key, uh, key um, institutes working on a cure for HIV. And the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation is um, supportive of that and all of their efforts in the entire world um, that are, are working on a cure for HIV. Um, and uh, the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation is part of the World AIDS Institute, um, which can be 
Uh, information about the World AIDS Institute can be found at um, worldaidsinstitute.org, or and uh, I encourage people to go go to our site and then um, to learn more about the um, the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation and the World AIDS Institute. Um, we have we're trying to get people encouraged to um, work with us and. Um, Basically, uh, we have a, uh, a thing called the Cure Coalition, and uh, we'd like to have people join us. Okay, thank you. Keep that microphone in your hand, because I have a great question uh, from the audience. Uh, someone in the audience asks, is there any stigma related to being the only one cured? Or I, might I add to that, is there any sense of guilt, maybe, that, that you are the, the lucky one? I. I did have a sense of guilt, um, and that's basically the reason why I felt I needed to do work to um, not be the only person cured of HIV, which I was for a while. Um, since then, uh, a, um, a little girl um, who was born with HIV because her mother had HIV and she didn't, uh, her mother didn't receive treatment in time to prevent um, a mother to child um, transmission, and she has been cured, and uh, um, that's in Mississippi, and uh, we've talked with the doctor who treated her, and she is uh, doing fine, she's still doing fine, and they, they consider to be, her to be cured. Um, she is too young, she's only three, now she's too young to really join me in my, <laughs> my party. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and also, um, there is a young man in Minnesota who has received a cord blood um, transplant. Um, cord blood being uh, ben beneficial because it doesn't have to have the exact HLA match, like it doesn't have to have the exact tissue match. And um, it, um, it's actually better for um, people um, w of color because um, it's only Northern Europeans that have the um, CCR5 Delta 32 mutate, mu mutation, um, which uh, doesn't really include people of color, un unfortunately. Um, but uh, cord blood is actually one way to, um, to circumvent that um, in that uh, um, it uh, doesn't have to be um, uh, a person with uh, uh, a person that has the exact tissue type of the patient. Okay, we have a, a, a pretty popular question from the audience, which is, how do you detect? How do you find these people who have the natural immunity against HIV? Um, I don't know who one of the one of the esteemed three doctors on the panel here should be able to. Not that you're not esteemed as well, Timothy, <laughs> but. Maybe these guys have an answer to that. Well, I probably do the, the most work in diagnostic virology, mm -hmm. so, so I'll take that. Um, it's it's a, a simple for the person blood test. We simply need to take some blood, but then we really need to look at the gene that encodes this kind of gateway that, that Hans Peter was talking about. And so we can look at the gene there and see whether it's the standard version of uh, CCR5 or whether it's this Delta 32 variant. Um, and, um, you know, in, in groups in Europe have done a lot of this where they've tested person after person to try to find more people so that more people could get a match like this. In the U.S. there have been similar efforts, um, but the math is just incredibly hard and it only fits in certain, you know, ethnic groups like you just heard. Um, so one really neat thing, and maybe I'll just hand this over to Hans-Peter, is that this sort of approach will allow this to go to other groups as well, because it'll be making the person's own cells into this magic Delta 32. Yeah, my follow-up here is really that we can also do the same thing with core blood cells. So we can, if the core blood cells are not CCR5, you know, negative or HIV resistant, we can actually also take those core blood cells to the laboratory and then make those resistant to HIV. It's actually almost easier to do that than adult cells, you know, male cells. So that's quite promising, and I know uh, we and others are working on that um, as well. 
Are there more uh, cases in the works as we speak with people who maybe who have been in a similar situation? There are, there's a, an ex, a large sport blood bank and people have been screening the sport bloods for this to see if there are higher variations. So there's likely going to be more of these transplants soon. Mm -hmm. The problem with um, cord blood is that it's not profitable. So um, all the money has to come from federal grants or donations. Um, I saw, I was, at, I att attended a conference in San Francisco um, last year and found out that uh, they operated a loss. And so they, they really require this money um, from, from the federal government or private donations. There's a, um, here's a question from the audience for you, Timothy. Did your doctor expect that that uh, stem cell transfer was going to cure the HIV? Yeah, okay, I, maybe I shouldn't turn it off. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, he did expect it, um, and uh, he told me that I could possibly be cured in, in the sense that I could, didn't ever have to worry about HIV anymore. I didn't really believe it until, um, until uh, he got his report that he had done for the New England Med Journal of Medicine published. Um, they didn't publish it the first time, and uh, then um, he got written up by the Washington Post, and then picked up, that was picked up by the um, New York Times, and, and then <coughs> the uh, New England Journal of Medicine came back and said, we've reconsidered. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was published. And I actually, um, once, once it had cleared um, a lot of uh, medical scientists' uh, opinion, I thought, okay, maybe I am cured. <laughs> <laughs> that was proof. Uh, Dr. Andrasik, maybe this would be a good uh, question for you. For, for many people living with HIV, being positive becomes part of their identity through their activism and community. How might an effective yet expensive cure affect that identity? I guess, uh, I guess what they're asking is, do you graduate from, uh, you know, from uh, HIV AIDS once you are, once you are uh, cured, if that's going to be the case for more people? Well, I mean, it would obviously be on an individual basis, but for me, I mean, my fight with, uh, within HIV is more along social justice lines. So I feel that even though uh, we may be closer to a cure, um, are we closer to solving some of the larger issues that plague our society, like discrimination, racism, poverty, violence, um, all of which are implicated in uh, HIV transmission, in acquisition, and um, you know, there's, it's, there's no coincidence that the most marginalized communities are the ones that are most impacted by HIV. So if there is a cure, when there is a cure, uh, will we still be plagued by some of these societal factors that continue to marginalize and disenfranchise large segments of our population? Mm -hmm. and I, think, I think if we're to look to the example of the first person cured, there has been no waning in your activism, no, uh, no dimming in the, f the fire that you feel for all these causes. No, it's very important to me that I'm still accepted by the HIV positive community. <laughs> uh, a as a person who was um, positive twice as long as I've been, been cured. So yeah, I, I completely identify with HIV positive people. And uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of them are my friends still, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we have a sister website called HIV on Trial, and this, it's got everything laid out, so you know, if this is your situation, you want to be in a trial, go through those and see if we've got something that, that fits, because this is a partnership, and we're working hard, and we need you to work hard, because we've got to beat this thing together. Can I just point to the fact that there are little cards with lovely Julie's photo on them, mm -hmm. and, um, right? Uh, uh, yes, yes, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the back side of those are the websites where you can go to find that uh, Dr. Jerome was speaking of, where you can find out some information. Yes. yes. And for vaccines right. as well. So cure research and vaccine research have tons of stuff going on right here in Seattle. Here's a question from the audience. Why do we need a cure? Actually, a very interesting question. When meds keep HIV positive people undetectable. We can't afford meds for everyone in the world, and unfortunately, and uh, a, a cure is necessary. And uh, I, I want to um, say that uh, that we need, yeah, we definitely need a cure, and uh, and that's why my case is very important because it um, basically pushes. Uh, um, people into talking about a cure again, where it hadn't been talked about for many years, as was mentioned. And can I just add, you know, for, for those of you who um, have loved ones and close friends who are HIV positive, you'll know that there are medications available, but, you know, the side effects for some of these medications, dry mouth, um, weight gain, um, insomnia, uh, and I could continue, the list goes on, um, sometimes and many times affect people's quality of life. So if you would ask friends and loved ones about their experience on HIV meds, you're, you're not gonna get a rosy story. Um, so it's, it's not an ideal situation to, to be taking some of the meds in many situations. In other situations, you know, people don't have any side effects. But the majority of people that I know um, who are living with HIV have some pretty substantial side effects that impact their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And Timothy, you're a very unique example, not only in being the first person cured, but also, I assume, the first person to voluntarily take the meds and then not have to take right. them yeah, as I, well. I quit taking my meds on the day of my transplant, with my first transplant, and never took any after that. So, and that was the to the suggestion of my partner who said he thought that the, the meds might influence the growth of the stem cells. I don't know if that's true, but um, uh, I talked the Dr. Uter into not making me take the medication. And uh, I'm very happy that that happened. Otherwise, I'd be like everyone else who, they would never have known that I was actually cured. But um, the proof that I'm cured is that I haven't had to take any meds for the last six years, and um, and then still have and, and beyond that, my T cells have increased um, to a normal level. Um, they're at 850 right now, um, so that, yeah, it's quite high. Um, and uh, I'm doing very well, and I. Um, while I was living in San Francisco, I did have colds quite often, um, but I think it was the climate. Because <laughs> it's, San Francisco is cold. <laughs> um, don't move there thinking you're gonna have warm weather, <laughs> which I made the mistake of doing. Uh, um, anyway, uh, yeah, I, um, I'm very, I should probably add, with the newer medications, patients can fortunately stay on right. the, on the um, antiviral mm -hmm. therapy, which is good, so they can just take it throughout right. the transfer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this might be a fitting final question from the audience. What would you say, and I'll just throw this out to the entire panel, to encourage newly infected young people to hold on to hope, and how can they be part of the cure? It's kind of a big question. I, I, tend, I tend to think that a cure is, um, I know it's inevitable, um, but the question is when, and I, I think uh, we're moving much closer to it. And uh, if, you're, if you're newly infected, please continue to take me your medication. Um, you'll prevent, uh, if you take your medication and you get your viral load down below the detectable level, um, you won't infect other people and you won't be prosecuted for infecting other people. So please take your medication.